All right. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, excited to present tonight. Um, so yeah, gonna go ahead and get started with uh, some digital security stuff. Um, all right, just gotta get some screens arranged. There we go. Okie dokie. All right, so I think we, we all know each other already, um, but uh, I'm Nicole Lopez. Uh, I've been going to Shy Hack Night quite a bit within the past year, and um, I'm a software developer with Digital Defense Fund, um, where I do cybersecurity evaluations and um, work on like cybersecurity for nonprofit orgs um, in the abortion access space. And I'm also the director of engineering and the board secretary for the Midwest Access Coalition, a, a Chicago-based nonprofit. Um, wow. Introduce yourself. And my name is Kwa, uh, and I'm the newer guy. Um, probably have not met me yet. Uh, I did uh, attend a couple in the past, but um, I saw an opportunity um, for just getting the word out about digital um, security, and I felt like that was in my wheelhouse. So um, I'm here now. I, I do uh, security, cybersecurity work for a company called Target Smart. We're um, a political data company works uh, closely with the DNC to um, promote progressive uh, policies. Yes, and so today, what we're gonna talk about is some digital security stuff. So we're gonna talk about kind of like some common pitfalls and solutions that we advise folks to take. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, like get some getting some hands-on experience um, about like um, you know, how to secure your accounts, and then some tactical tips for how to apply those to your life. Um, so we're going to cover is some threat modeling. So like kind of like ground ourselves in what we're dealing with. We're going to talk about some password security. We're going to talk about multi-factor authentication, and we're going to talk about phishing. So uh, before we start, uh, I just think it's really important to dispel this notion that there's like a superhero wizard tech guy person because we are all tech people, we're all interacting with technology. And like a lot of the knowledge that we gain um, to deal with cybersecurity stuff is like people-based, it's process-based. And you don't have to be a super technical person to become deeply engaged and to, to learn a lot about this and to implement some like security best practices in your life. So um, this is everybody's work. Um, because everybody is interacting with the internet. Um, and you're probably doing a lot of cybersecurity things uh, in your day-to-day -day life that maybe you aren't even thinking about as security. So yeah, feel free to pop in the chat, uh, in the live chat, like what you're already doing to protect your own security. Um, and if you're part of an organization, like maybe work or if you volunteer with an organization, um, we're going to think about, you know, curious how you are uh, dealing with that as well. Uh, but first, we're going to start with some threat modeling. So what am I talking about here? Like threat modeling is basically how we can help ground our fears in reality. Um, so with that, um, you know, it's important to like kind of just dis dispel like like what it like the, the scariest thing is the unknown thing, right? Like the scary thing is when your imagination goes wild and when you think like um like all sorts of terrible things could be happening, right? So when we when we start to look at like, okay, what is likely to occur, what actually occurs, and we kind of pick apart what is a threat and how how does stuff go down in the wild it can make things a lot less scary and also can help us figure out where to prioritize our defenses. Um, so we're in the civic tech space and um, we, we actually gave this training um, to a group of older people. Um, and that's sort of like what uh, got us, you know, got, got us together to give training and then got us, um, you know, like that we decided, okay, this is actually a really good topic to present a shy hack night. Um, and so I'm going to get meta a little bit and like we're training, but also like in terms of like how to give a training to, um, it's important to like, we had tailored these slides, um, and I left them in here to specifically call this out, um, to city government officials, 
right? Because threats can look different depending on what you're doing. So it's important to think about like, okay, from the context of city government, right? Like what types of things are happening in the wild? So we're seeing a lot of ransomware happening. Like it's become uh, something that's happened more and more recently. Um, city governments are definitely not immune to this stuff. And like in Atlanta and Baltimore, uh, numerous other cities like Greenville, North Carolina, um, ransomware has like really thrown a wrench in a city's ability to like deliver its services, right? Um, so that's the type of threat that we're, we're seeing out in the wild. Um, and in Chicago, uh, another thing that's happened with city uh, government is that, you know, hacked emails, um, a hack was exposing emails that were in discovery at a law firm um, to the public. So, you know, even like, you know, even though the city wasn't hacked, the vendor or the law firm that the city was using was hacked and the city data was released. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that these threats could look. So we, when we're threat modeling, we also like to think about like, what is likely, you know, like what is likely to occur by like, what has actually happened? So there's a great, uh, there's a nonprofit based um, security uh, or uh, IT managed service provider firm called Community IT that has started releasing incident reports of all of the incidents that they are seeing occur across all of their clients. So um, this is their most recent report and it's showing like one, we're looking at, you know, occurrences over a number of years and every single one of these or almost every single one of these, we're seeing these occurrences go up first of all. And then we're also seeing like what types of attacks are happening. So spam, note here, I get, it's on this graphic, it's a little bit difficult to see what the scale is, right? Um, but with spam, we're seeing that's like happening in the hundreds. Uh, malware is almost up at 100. Spear phishing, the highest is almost at 200. But then when we look at something like a virus or an advanced persistent threat, we're looking at maybe like a handful of things. So um, an important thing to note here is that like spam, yeah, super common. Spear phishing, super, super common. And then spear phishing, it's also important to note here that like when we're talking about types of attacks, um, phishing is also a vector and like a, a, a means to escalate to some of these other, maybe more severe types of attacks, right? So we can start at spear phishing and that phishing, that, that fish, could actually be tricking somebody to download ransomware, right? Or the fish could be used to compromise an account. Um, so these super likely kind of commonplace occurrences can lead to a less common, more severe type of incident. Another thing that's important to note when we're thinking about what's likely to occur is also just like the mundane things in life, you know? bad stuff happens sometimes, like you lose your phone or your computer, like that's a cybersecurity incident, right? Um, and that's a type of incident that we want to protect any additional fallout from. Um, if you're in an organization, you know, sometimes your threat actors um, can be people you know in your organization. Um, and then people get sick sometimes. I mean, we've been living through a pandemic, so that's you know made us all confront our collective mortality a little bit more, right? Like these are the types of things um, that can cause, you know, one to lose access to your data or to have your accounts get compromised and become a cybersecurity incident. Um, another thing, like, I guess, like, basically, like, really with, with threat modeling, context is the key here. So your threat model, it, this isn't a one-size-fits-all thing. It really depends on what you're doing. Like, are you participating in a protest? your threat model is going to be different and the types of threats you're going to face are going to be a bit different. You're going to be a little bit more subject to surveillance um, by the state per, per se. Or are you talking to the media, right? Um, that means that maybe your name, you're going on the record or being quoted for something, your name is going to get out there. And that means that, you know, if you're saying something uh, controversial or something that's putting a target on your back, that means that you might face some threats pertaining to online harassment a little bit more. Another piece of context that's really important when defining what our threat model is, is 
like your aspects of your individual um, identity, right? Like these are like race, immigration status, gender, like these are things that impact how you move through the world and how you are treated in broader society. These color all of our interactions everywhere. So um, our individual context really informs our threat model in terms of like, uh, for instance, with immigration status, the fallout of a data breach could be super severe if it is showing that somebody's um, immigration status has expired or or uh, lapsed or something. Um, there's different um, different severity for different types of threats, and the fallout could be greater or lesser depending on these different aspects of your identity. So how do we build this threat model, right? Like, so when we're like trying to think about what is, what is my threat uh, model? Like how, how am I impacted? So we wanna think about what has happened before. Um, if you're in an organization, you wanna think about what has happened like specifically at your organization before. Have there been incidents before um, to inform what's likely to potentially happen again? Um, are you more or less visible? are certain, like, are you a bit more in the public eye? Um, are you super outspoken about certain things? Um, are certain members of your organization more um, public than others? Are you or people in your org already experiencing like stalking or harassment? That means your threat level is already elevated, right? Um, are you part of a marginalized community? Um, that elevates the threat model. And then also just identifying who are the threat actors. That's another piece of defining this threat model, right? Are we talking fraudsters here? Like your run-of-the-mill scammers? Are we talking uh, ideological extremists? Are we talking law enforcement or the state? Um, so basically when we think about our threats in this manner, this helps us to ground them in reality so that we can, tact so that we can tactically address uh, what we need to, uh, to get the most return, right, of our efforts. So when we like to, I like to think about this on an axis of severity versus likelihood. Um, so when we're looking at, um, like just for example, we have some threats here, published data breach, phishing, lost device, targeted brute force attack. Um, phishing could be a lot more severe if you fall for it. Like there are certain things that are like being having your data in a data breach. It's pretty likely, right? Uh, happens a lot. Is the fallout of that super severe? I mean, I'm in a ton of data breaches, and it has not impacted my life that much aside from getting more spam. So I would rate rank that not as severe. Um, so this helps us think through, you know, what should we really prioritize? So for things that are both likely and severe, like that's where we want to focus our efforts, right? So we're gonna hone in on account security because we know that that is a thing that everybody is universal to people, right? We all have accounts in different things. And we do know that there's an ecosystem out there of um, folks stealing credentials and passwords and monetizing that. So why do people want your email and password, right? Usually it's to, like it's either to get some data or, uh, or get data that can be monetized, right? Um, Oftentimes money is a big motivator here. So how does this actually go down? Um, when we're, there are a couple different ways that attackers are gonna get your password. Um, guessing uh, with password reuse, uh, with phishing, or maybe your device got stolen. So when we're talking about guessing, we're not talking about, I mean, yes, there could be somebody who's, you know, guessing, oh, you know what, their dog's name is Fluffy, Fluffy329, right? Like there, that could be a thing, but guessing more frequently is happening with bot attacks um, called like dictionary attacks or credential stuffing where automatically um, all sorts of permutations of email password, email password or passwords are just being thrown at a login form until it works. Um, and when we're talking about buying it, like there's an entire online ecosystem of stolen data um, and like people are just trading credentials or, or selling credentials um, or selling, selling stolen, stolen credentials, stolen data sets online for other hackers to, uh, to use for gain, right? Um, we're gonna talk about phishing a bit later, 
um, basically being tricked into giving up your account information and then stealing the device or seeing a post-it. Um, so I love this comic because I think it really illustrates this like fear aspect. And on the left panel, we're saying how people think hacking works and it's control. We've flown to the USA and breached the target's house. They wrote all their passwords in a book labeled passwords, the fool. Like, right, that's really targeted on you and your stuff. And somebody's really out there to get your stuff, right? But in reality, it's a lot more like throwing, the more common thing is like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks, right? Like most commonly you're gonna get swept up in a low effort spray attack. Like, hey, look, someone leaked the emails and passwords from the Smash Mouth message boards. Cool, let's try it on Venmo, right? Like that's not somebody trying really targeting you and your stuff. That's somebody just trying to make a quick buck on a data set. So could somebody have your password right now? The answer is yeah, probably, at least one of them. Um, so I'm gonna demo one of my, email accounts, uh, an older email account with have I been pwned because, oh yes, this email has been pwned quite a few times. This is a great site that allows you to check um, uh, your e to search for your email across all these like stolen data sets. So what this will allow us to do is we can see what data has been compromised, it was compromised, the context, and then like what all was released here. So this allows us to, you know, really see like, hey, you know, if my threat model, if I have stalking in my threat model and I see that addresses got leaked in this data set, that's something that maybe it will inform how I'm going to act next, right? Um, but for the most part, like, what do you do if you're in a whole bunch of data breaches, right? Um, so the things that we want to be thinking about um, oh, and yes, pro tip, subscribe your email address to have it in phone so that you'll get an alert if you're in a breach. This is actually what a lot of those like identity monitoring services are doing. Um, I did pay for one of them at one point. Um, and then I realized that have I been pwned was giving me the same information, but faster and for free. So definitely a great service here. Um, but the really like, this shouldn't incite any panic, but the big thing to think about here is like, what, like, what all, what have I been putting under that same email account? Because that email address is going to have a target on its back now, right? It's going to be more at risk for phishing and for these things that could escalate into something else. And then also, what passwords have I been reusing? So, say, like, we noticed there was the LinkedIn breach, right? Did I use my LinkedIn password in? a whole bunch of other places, because if I use my LinkedIn password for my bank account as well, and LinkedIn gets breached, the hacker isn't just going to try to do stuff with LinkedIn. What they're going to do is try, okay, email password. Let's try this in a whole bunch of different places and see where we can make some money and get some access, right? So it's really how, you know, how like password reuse um, is a really big risk here. Um, and so the good news is that there are some really like simple things you can do to increase your account security to guard against these super common types of attacks, right? Because data breaches aren't going away anytime soon, um, but you can defend against them. And I'm going to pass it over to Claude to let us know how. All right. Thanks, Nicole. So in the, let's see, about 10-ish minutes we have left 20 minutes we have left um i'm gonna go over some ways to strengthen your password and some very uh, like concrete tips to um protect yourself against um some of the basic things that nicole's mentioning like uh, dictionary attacks or hackers just trying um all the different words and and possible permutations to get your password so um the trick it's no secret is to use a strong unique password uh, but what makes a password strong? All right. So on the next slide, you can use. Oh, uh, let's let's go back real quick. Yeah, you can use this um, this website right here to check your passwords right now. Actually, how secure is my password.net? Go ahead. I'll give you a second. You can type it in. How secure is my password.net? Um, your browser. Pull it up on your phone. Uh, you can. Try it along with me. Uh, I have some pictures here, so um, it'll go a little quicker, but you can try your own passwords, of course. 
So if you were to type in something like the word password, uh, duh, you would be cracked instantly. Uh, why duh? Because that's a very common, common, common uh, password that people use. Uh, and that would be the first thing that hackers would guess, right? Or that'd be the first thing on the list uh, of, of what the bot would try to guess, right? So we, we know we've heard some of these things of how to make it more complex, right? And your social media accounts and all of your different accounts may even require certain complexity requirements from you. Um, so just to review some of those that make something like this password much, much stronger, right? On the next slide. Uh, you know, this, uh, this graphic doesn't show upper lowercase, but that would be one way, right? Those are, you have, Instead of just 26 characters, you have twice that. Um, of course, symbols. Symbols are a way to increase complexity and numbers, right? Numbers are also another way to add just more characters to, to, the, to the pool of, of what could be used, right? So this would take a computer about two weeks to crack, right? If you ran, ran a, a program that was just constantly guessing all the different ones, right? A person could try in. Fluffy one, fluffy two, fluffy three. That's not going to work. It's going to take too long, but a computer can do it in two weeks. They could probably crack something like this in two weeks, right? The last part or the, the last thing that can add complexity actually is just increasing the length, right? The other one maybe was about 10 characters. This one, you just add uh, about five more characters here and look how long it takes. It would take a computer about 3 million years to crack your password. So actually, the most important part of uh, making your password complex is to just add more characters, make it much longer. Uh, so for example, on the next slide, you could even not include symbols and still get away with purple monkey dishwasher, which are just common words. And it would take a computer 45 quintillion years to crack. I, I looked it up and I think it's like 18 zeros, which you know, for the purposes of this means impossible. Uh, so <laughs> it's not gonna be able to crack purple monkey dishwasher that easily, right? So the next slide, the thing to take away, right? Is that remembering unique complex passwords though can be very, very hard, right? And some of you all were posting in the live chat. Um, that's why we use password managers with tildes, password managers. So this is, um, if you don't know what a password manager is, on the next slide, let me tell you. <laughs> password, so a password manager or a password management service generates and holds diverse, strong passwords. The picture we have here is of a, an app or a browser extension you can actually add to your browser it's called LastPass, probably because it's the last password manager you're ever gonna use. Other, I don't know why they call it that, but that's my reasoning. So you can see here, it saves all the different sites you might use, right? Um, and it does all the work for you. Now, this, you might think, oh, this seems like the thing I use with my browser now um, with Chrome or Edge. It saves my password for me. Is that a password manager? And yes and no. Um, the thing is, with the, I'm gonna call it a password safe, the ones you use in the browser, these password safes, they make it more convenient for you to, to fill in your passwords, right? Auto fill in your passwords, so, and you don't have to remember them, which is convenient, but it is not a dedicated tool for saving your passwords, right? So the next slide, why is a password manager better than just what you use in your browser, right? Um, something like LastPass, you can download it, it is free, in case you were wondering, it is free. Um, it's convenient to log into. It's a one-click sort of solution. You're in, you don't have to think too hard about that one. The second point is that that's more, um, is the benefit over just like a password safe in browser, in a browser, is that it can generate random passwords. So those long passwords that you saw that were uh, impossible to crack, it can create those for you and it can remember them for you. Um, this is important because uh, some password managers will warn you when you have weak or reused passwords. So if it can generate a new password every time, you'll never reuse them. And um, you may never have a warning from a password manager about that. Um, some other 
benefits of using a password manager, especially if you're working in an organization, uh, is to is that it can enable safe sharing of sensitive information. Um, the password manager is essentially a big safe, uh, which you can put not just uh, login information, you can also put in different keys or, or things like that. Another thing is it can help warn you of phishing. So if you were to click on a, a, a random link in an email and it took you to a website that looked legitimate, the password manager would know, hey, this is actually not legitimate and I'm not going to autofill um, this for you where uh, a browser like uh, password safe might. And lastly, it stores, your passwords are stored securely with end-to-end -end encryption. Um, all you need to know about that is that it's like a secret code. Your password comes uh, all jarbled up. Nobody, nobody knows, is gonna know what it is. If you were subpoenaed by the FBI for some reason, God forbid, even the FBI would not be able to get into it because LastPass would not even know what the secret uh, decoder uh, key would be to get to your passwords, right? So that's really important with password management too. You wanna keep that very secure. Okay, so on the next slide, like I was saying, uh, password manager can generate super strong passwords. Uh, it's just a click of a button. You can go <laughs> to 43 if you really wanted to. Um, but as you saw on the other one, even up to uh, 15, 20 is, is decent. And Kevin Mitnick, you know, the world's most famous hacker in the 90s, who is now a security consultant, you know, you, people can change their lives. Um, he recommends at least 22 to 25 ish, right? So you don't have to do 43, 22 to 25 should uh, do the work for you, okay? So is there a catch to this though? Kind of, not really, right? With the password manager, there is one password that you will have to remember. It does, the password manager doesn't keep a copy of this password. It is the key to unlock all of the other passwords. So without it, all your information is encrypted and scrambled. It's really important that it is unique, long and strong, but also something you can remember without writing it down, right? This is the master password word, the only one you'll have to remember. Um, some people might say, hey, but isn't that like giving the keys to the kingdom if somebody were to, to hack it? Well, that's why you just wanna make sure it's very unique and strong, okay? And you shouldn't have to worry about that. Um, all right, so, a password manager, uh, for sure, if we're talking about those uh, those different threats that could happen, it lessens the severity uh, of how much those things can impact you, right? Because they're less likely to happen with a password manager, right? So the key takeaway is to do whatever you can to avoid weak passwords and password reuse, right? Increasing complexity and using a password manager, right? But you can take that a step further Right? Wouldn't you want to go a step further? You want to really be secure, use multi-factor authentication. We've heard of this. Some of us may have heard of this. But just in case, multi-factor authentication keeps your account safe even if your password is compromised. Right? This is like the second barrier to entry here. Right? Um, why is it called multi-factor or two-factor? Um, the different factors are the different ways to verify your identity, to authenticate you, right? Usually it's something that you know, like a password and something that you have, which nowadays everybody has a phone and that is usually what's used as the second factor, okay? Um, Multi-factor authentication, simply put, means that your password is one of two pieces of information you need to access your account. Um, there are different there are a lot of different ways. There are three I'm gonna talk about briefly um, is it can be a text to your phone. It can be something called an authenticator app, which is a, an app that will give you a code, which you put into the login uh, portal. Or the last one is something called a UB key or a physical key. So this is something, it's almost like a tiny USB. You kind of plug it in and you have to physically touch it or press a button or something on it. Right, an authenticator app. Um, we have uh, the Microsoft Authenticator, uh, Google's Smart Lock, um, Auth, Authy. I think that's the other one. Um, there are a lot, and and so as you're logging in, it'll send you a code to your phone. You have to 
verify the code or you have to um, hit OK or something like that, right? And then the other way is the security key. So we watch this GIF real quick. All right, so we're kind of in the middle of it, but this person's touched the key and it's let them um, sign in right after they've put in their password. So there are pros and cons to all of them. Um, the UV key, you probably, you'll have to pay while the other ones are, you have to pay for the physical device while the other ones are free, free options in getting a text message or an authenticator code, um, right? So why, why, why should we have to do this, All right? Like, I, I get that, right? Like, you're just trying to log in and you hit the page and it tells you to go to your phone and for me, sometimes I like audibly sigh, <sighs> really, <laughs> I have to do this again. But think about this, you know, I'll put it this way, you know, it's, it's 20 more seconds uh, that you can protect yourself versus letting your social media account get hacked, letting your sensitive data um, get exposed, right? So it's a small thing. It takes a little bit more time, but it's much, uh, much, much more effective at, at preventing hackers from getting into your account. So how effective is it? One way you can measure is how likely um, an account is going to be taken over, right? And, and the prevention rate of that. Um, if you look at this uh, graphic right here, starting from the top, um, an on-device prompt, like an authenticator app, right? Um, the bars, they're the different kinds of ways somebody can attack, but as you can see, most of them are at 100% or near preventing somebody from taking over your account. Right, uh, text message um, also very very effective at this. Uh, less effective if you are specifically targeted. There are certain attacks that um, hackers get very savvy with, and they can get your phone number and, and start to get your messages. So there's a little bit on that one, but as you can see, mostly for the most part, it is um, effective at preventing uh, an account takeover. And lastly, security key. Um, you are 100%. Uh, preventing somebody from taking over your account, right? Okay, Just so a quick yeah, a, yeah, a quick note about uh, those as well. Um, that the attack for folks who are interested in learning more about that type of phone attack, it's called SIM jacking, and there's a really good Reply All podcast about that. Um, the Snapchat thief, so that's a good one to listen to and learn more about phone jacking or SIM SIM jacking rather. So we can go into the next slide. So it does sound scary, right? There's a lot of ways hackers have found to, to get to you, but um, take these small steps, right? Just take a couple of these steps and they can really just improve and really harden your digital security game. Um, it just, you know, the, uh, the other way you can think about it is like, why not? Um, you know, it's 20 seconds to letting everything else get exposed like that. So, um, you know, turning on uh, two-factor authentication for sure lessens the severity of an attack of if an attack were to occur uh, of, of it being damaging because it probably they wouldn't, they wouldn't have gotten in in the first place. All right. So the key takeaway to turn on two-factor authentication this way, even if you get pwned, you won't get hacked. All right. So uh, we have a little bit of time left. And Nicole is going to highlight some of those big red flags um, you should look out for when uh, of, of phishing emails. Yeah, so I'm going to go real fast through this. Like, yeehaw, people. So for phishing, what we're talking about here is when people are trying to defraud you out of some information uh, through an electronic communication. Um, so we're talking about scams where somebody's trying to act like they're trustworthy, but they're really not in some type of um, communication. And half of the time they're, they don't actually need, they like, they have less information than they are making themselves seem to have. We'll, we'll get some examples here in a second. Um, and then, yeah, like oftentimes these hacks or like phishing can feel very, um, like make you feel very vulnerable, but oftentimes like they, they don't actually have your password. They don't actually have the access. Um, and it's meant to scare you into action, to scare you into panicking and divulging that information. So just here's a quick example of phishing. Like this one's very like, hi, visualizing my inner self, thinking of someone in the office. Like that sounds pretty shady, right? Like I'd be like, what 
<laughs> no. <laughs> but when we're looking at something like instant ASAP, where, you know, would it be possible for you to complete a task for me before this conference ends? If that's coming, if it's, if that looks like it's coming from your boss and you're not checking what is the scam email that it's coming from, that can be pretty compelling, right? Uh, and then the next step in that scam, like if you take the bait would be, hey, I need you to send me Amazon gift cards or Google Play gift cards and with, with the code. Like this is a very common second step uh, progression of if you fall for that first bait, right? So how do people do this? They do this with email spoofing. They do this with data from data breaches, right? And they do this with um, like just from gleaning information about your organization on like on LinkedIn, for instance, or on your company website or on your personal website, right? Like people are using things that people are putting out there um, like for, ne uh, for nefarious purposes. So yes, password breaches can definitely be used to concoct some kind of scary phishing, phishing scams. This is one that my coworker actually received um, and she realized it was part of the LinkedIn breach, but essentially it's, hi, I know that blah, blah, blah is your password, right? So that is essentially the, the thing to induce the panic, right? And it says, as you may, may have noticed, I sent this from your email account. They didn't, but they made it look like they did, right? They changed the display to make it look like they did. So of course, this is where panic brain happens, right? And I infected you with my private malware and I watched you doing things on your computer or through your webcam, right? Like this is meant to like to short circuit logical thinking and go straight to panic where people are going to be in a reactive mindset and fall for the bait, right? So what we're getting, what I'm getting at here is the psychology of this, right? So why does this work? It works because Fisher, like scammers are capitalizing on our urge to be polite, our urge to help other people, our fear of being embarrassed and any panic, right? So, and it, it bears noting that like some of these things like being polite, wanting to be helpful, these are things that might make you a good employee or a good friend, right? So they're capitalizing on things that like make you good at being a person and like, um, and, you know, are part of like you being a nice person, right? So they're um, kind of capitalizing on that type of stuff. This also happens over text and over phone calls. Um, and over the phone, it's just the pressure to act can be a lot faster. Um, really, I'm going to breeze through these real fast. Uh, but essentially, every single piece of an email can be a big clue for you that, um, that you're being fished. Big things to look for in the from field, like a major thing to see is, um, is the name that's being displayed, the actual email address that it's coming from, because those are pretty, that's a pretty trivial thing to change. Um, and a lot of like email providers will show this pretty easily. Um, so this should be a thing to check um, very regularly with emails. Um, hyperlinks are also a very tricky one. A general rule of thumb is if a login link is sent to you via email that you didn't initiate, right? You're not, I'm not talking about a password reset flow. I'm talking about your account is in blah, blah, blah status. Log in to correct it. That login button just goes straight to, as a general rule of thumb, don't log in from a link that is sent to you in an email. Log in, just go to, go to the site directly. And if there is urgent action that you need to take on your account, it's going to show up in your account. Um, and another thing to note with, um, the hyperlinks is that misspelled hyperlinks are meant for your eyes to brush over and see just as close enough, right? So we're talking like people will buy up domains that are sneaky, like Bank of America instead of Bank of America, where that R and the N bleed together to look like an M, right? Uh, ones for L's, things like that. Um, a big thing just in terms of anatomy of a link and looking at a link um, it's really important to know what the actual website is when you're looking at a link. So this, this is a cute little graphic, check for trash before the slash. So the main website that you're going to be on is the last thing before the dot, like it's thing dot thing slash whatever. So the last blah dot blah uh, before slashes start happening in a URL is the actual site you're on. And then anything that's in front of that 
still belongs to that like root site. So when we're looking at www.google.com.info, that is not google.com. The main site there is com.info. Um, Bankofamerica.us.com.web app. Com.webapp is the is the main website. Um, this is a very tricky one right here. Uh, it bears noting like one, the email address that this is coming from is google.support. Plausible, right? That's plausible. Um, and then the link that it's going to looks like it's going to a Google address. But if we if we go with our no trash before the slash, we have a few like fake slashes and then we have another tinyurl.com. So what this is doing is it's going to open tinyurl.com in a Google search um, or like go through it that way, right? Um, so just another sneaky way to redirect um, to where you don't know where you're going. Um, another giant red flag is attachments. Basically anytime you receive an attachment and you aren't expecting an attachment, it should be a red flag. Um, because a lot of harm can be done with an attachment. Um, here's an example of like Red Robin, uh, basically a very compelling email sent from what seems like it would be a reasonable like customer email, ray.donovan84 at yahoo.com with a complaint, please see my attached complaint. If you're in customer service, like that would be a really compelling thing, right? Um, so, and then that basically allowed hackers to map the network and take over more and more things. Um, so those are always a big red flag. So um, phishing is hard and no shame, no blame. Like really the biggest defense against it is to slow down and to trust, but verify, like call somebody, text somebody, hey, did you send me this? Um, and don't click. If you did click, you should tell somebody though, um, especially if you're at work, because things can be going on in the background without you knowing. Um, and yeah, so the key takeaway here is really to, to trust your gut. Like if something, and also if like something is asking you, like some, if you're being requested money, asking you to open attachment, if there's like a, an emotional response that's being elicited out of you, that's a, hey, let's, let's check for the authenticity here. Let's slow down. Um, and some other key takeaways from tonight are um, like what, like, so, okay, so we talked about phishing. We also need to avoid password reuse and weak passwords and uh, turn on that two-factor authentication so that we are, our accounts are protected. And yeah, essentially trust your gut. Uh, you know what is on or off in your um, context the best and your threat model. So yeah, um, we have some other resources and whatnot, but I'm gonna just like pop ahead to questions. Ooh, all right, that was a lot, thank you. Yeehaw. <laughs> thank you, uh, Nicole and Quad, that was awesome. So we did get a bunch of, there's a lot of action in the chat. Um, some questions were actually asked and then answered in the chat, but one that I thought was maybe worth um, diving into first, which was I think Paul, when you were showing that website, how strong is my password? Someone had a question about that site, which is how do we know that site won't misuse the password we are testing? I would say, um, well, you don't um, 100%. So I would say it's, a, it's better for an educational tool and for concept kind of like to understand the, okay, this is strong enough. So use something similar to it. Granted, how strong is my password? I believe is still run by, it was initially run by Dashlane, which is another password management company. So it is run by a like a trusted group, just like the have I been pwned, like there is some trust involved in that service as well. It's run by an independent security researcher who has proven <laughs> just, uh, has proven his character essentially. It's, his name is Troy Hunt. Yeah, and I would add, um, so something like Have I Been Pwned, too, I, I had come across that pretty recently, um, and I wasn't sure, like, if I put in my email, are you just going to take my email, and then you're going to spam me with it later? So, you know, you, you to do your due diligence, uh, like, something I did was to check the privacy policies, if they have anything like that, um, you know, so they, they tell you exactly how they're using what you're putting in, um, and I guess if they misuse it, you could sue them, um, but... Yeah, so, you know, double check that and then, yeah, just 
double check the source or like who's who's behind it uh, and if they are a reliable um, organization or person. Cool. You want to do the, I think we have time for one more. You want to do the, the last question, Sam? Um, yeah, so let's see. Uh, the next question here um, is kind of just like a general question about like how do you think or how long do you think it'll take like things like quantum computing to make um, all passwords, even those like three common word length passwords, like uh, owable or, you know, guessable. I mean, I don't know. Okay. So I guess I don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, to be honest with you, because like if once the quantum stuff happens, like all bets are off the table, basically, it like kind of renders a lot of this moot. And so, um, I don't know anything about the timeline for that, though. Um, yeah, I, I don't either. But think about are the hackers, if, if they're not a, a nation state, you know, funded by with all those resources, then are they going to have a quantum computer? Right. That could be one thing to think about. So maybe you shouldn't worry too much right now. That is maybe coming. But um, that's one thing I was thinking of. And then the other thing is I, I, I've been kind of playing with the idea of ideally at some point you wouldn't need a password. Um, if you do things through like single sign on, um, maybe you would have one password uh, or, or things like that. There's, there's ways to still be secure without a password. And that, that would be the ideal future. Yeah, and a lot of services are moving towards passwordless, just passwordless in general. Um, so yeah, that's a great point, Kwa, that like it, it might be irrelevant anyways, but for better reasons, because we found something better than passwords. Right on. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Thanks both so much for the presentation. Uh, this will be archived and I'm sure a helpful resource for a lot of folks to go back and, and read through all that. Um, maybe we'll get a chance to get a copy of the slide so we can share those out to get all those links that were in the last few slides. There's a lot of good stuff in there that, that I'm sure folks would wanna click on. Um, so I think, yeah, we're gonna switch over to the uh, civic hacking portion of the evening. So for folks who wanna stick around, uh, they'll be, we'll be shutting in the live stream, but then there'll be a, uh, a link to right here, uh, the remote Zoom call. So it's a Zoom and uh, they'll, we'll do some things like uh, intros and uh, breakout groups there. Uh, and the link here, we'll put that in the chat as well. Um, I think that might be it. I think, is there anything else we need to say, Sam? Um, nothing except what we usually say. I'll let you say it this time, go for it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, this is the time where we say, go forth and hack. <laughs>